The subject of today's session is not simple. One might even argue not appropriate, given the subject of the series of which this session is a part, which is obviously biblical holy days and their messages. Well, if we're speaking of biblical holy days, then why do we discern Hanukkah in the title? Hanukkah is, of course, a Jewish holiday, but it is decidedly not biblical. Hanukkah, of course, is mentioned nowhere in the Hebrew Bible. The Hebrew Bible concludes its canon long before the events of Hanukkah take place. There are, admittedly, the books of the Maccabees, which we regard as apocryphal. There is, as undoubtedly many of you are aware, a discussion among various Christian denominations with respect to the canonization of those books. But in any case, certainly we aren't regarding Hanukkah per se as a biblical holy day. And yet, the title, on some plane, admits that verity because the subject of our discussion most specifically in this session is surveying the ninth month in the Bible. Well, there are a number of references, as we shall see, to the ninth month. Obviously, we're defining the ninth month as it is defined in the Bible in light of Exodus chapter 12, verse 2, as ninth month with respect to the first month, the month of spring, the month of Passover. The ninth month is what takes place now, and it is indeed the month of Hanukkah. Now, considering what the significance of the ninth month is in the Bible doesn't seem to provide us with any insight whatsoever. So why, again, harping on the title, are we seeking in this survey of the ninth month precedence for Hanukkah and dedication? Well, admittedly, the answer is a bit tenuous. But my proposal nonetheless is, we posit that the holidays that are ordained by our tradition don't just happen. They signify the reappearance on a yearly basis of spiritual lights that come into the world and that precipitate the unique holy days that are associated with the different seasons of the year. And so I'm going to propose that we attempt to discern in the ninth month, in the time period that would only later precipitate the observance of the post-biblical holy day of Hanukkah, those same spiritual lights, precedence, again, for Hanukkah. Hanukkah, meaning, dedication. Now, before we embark upon this survey, there's another caveat that inevitably I need to add, and that is, for the most part, if you ask me what exactly took place in the Bible, during the ninth month? My answer would have to be, we don't know. After all, in the overwhelming majority of instances, we cannot produce so exacting a chronology of the events that unfold in the Bible. For the most part, it's enough of a challenge to know the year in which these events took place, but the month? And yet, there are certain instances, only a few, in which we can definitively associate 
a given passage, a given prophecy with a given month. In the case of our discussion today, the ninth. And it's on that note then that we focus initially on the very first instance in the Bible in which we read of an episode in one of the prophets that is so anchored in this time of year, ninth month. Jeremiah, chapter 36. Let's begin at the chapter's beginning, even though we only discover that we're discussing the ninth month a bit further in. But to understand the context, beginning in verse 1, it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came unto Jeremiah from God, saying, Take you a roll of a book and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto you concerning Israel and concerning Judah and concerning all the nations. Now, the term in the Hebrew, in particular, dibarti elecha al, does not necessarily have the connotation that the alternative translation here implies of speaking against. And yet, simultaneously, that is the content of what God spoke to Jeremiah. And that becomes clear in verse 3. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I think to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, and I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. This is, so to speak, one of their last chances. And so we read that Jeremiah called Baruch the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of God which he had spoken unto him, unto Jeremiah, upon a roll of a book. And Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, I am detained. The exact nature of this detainment isn't explicitly stated, but we can well surmise that given the reaction to Jeremiah's earlier prophecies of doom, he had been threatened not to come to the precincts of the temple to make any public proclamations. As a result, I am detained. I cannot come into the house of God. Therefore come you and read in the roll which you have written from my mouth, the words of God in the ears of the people in God's house upon a fast day. Upon a fast day, an opportunity for repentance, for introspection, an opportunity, perhaps, to hear sincerely the words of the prophet and reform one's ways. As indeed, we read in verse 7, it may be that they will present their supplication before God and will return everyone from his evil way. For great is the anger and the fury that God has pronounced, spoken concerning this people. And so we read in the continuation of the chapter that. Baruch, the son of Neriah, did according to all that Jeremiah the prophet commanded him, reading in the book the words of God in God's house. And here in verse 9, we encounter the first, the first of two, references to the ninth month. It came to pass in the fifth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, in the ninth month, that they proclaimed the fast before God all the people in Jerusalem and all the people that came from the cities of Judah unto Jerusalem. We're left wondering, what was the circumstance that prompted them to proclaim a fast? Now, we'll note that given the 
timing of the ninth month, not long after the rainy season is to commence, it commences normally in the eighth month. In general, if there are no rains in the eighth month, that would serve in our tradition as adequate reason to proclaim a fast in the ninth month to petition God for rain. The land of Israel, after all, is a thirsty land, very much dependent upon the rains coming in their proper time. That's true, but there may be a more immediate and dire reason for this fast day that isn't stated explicitly in the Bible. And indeed, we know this reason only from sources outside of the Bible. And that is, at this time, Nebuchadnezzar is on a rampage of conquest. It was at this time of year that he sacked Ashkelon, conquered it, and the news of this conquest certainly would have reached Jerusalem almost immediately. The fear, the dire fear that Jerusalem was already, so to speak, in the crosshairs of Nebuchadnezzar could well have prompted this fast day. And to that extent, perhaps in particular, prompted an openness to hearing the prophet's words, perhaps more so than previously. And so, in the context then of this fast day, we read in verse 10, Baruch read in the book the words of Jeremiah in the house of God in the chamber of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, the scribe, who we may recall is a supporter of Jeremiah, in the upper court at the entry of the new gate of God's house in the ears of all the people. And we read how the people and the princes indeed respond in utmost seriousness to the dire words pronounced by Baruch in the name of Jeremiah. And in the continuation, we're abridging in verse 19, the princes said to Baruch, go hide you, you and Jeremiah, and let no man know where you are. They obviously suspect that the king's response to these dire words of prophecy will not be particularly affectionate toward the prophet. And they, the princes, came into the king, into the court, having deposited the roll, the scroll, in the chamber of Elishama, the scribe, and they told all the words in the ears of the king. So the king sent Yehudi to fetch the roll, and he took it out of the chamber of Elishama, the scribe, and Yehudi read it in the ears of the king and in the ears of all the princes that stood over the king. And once again, we read the time of year because it is particularly germane for what follows, the king was sitting in the winter house in the ninth month. The ninth month, cold and rainy, and the brazier was burning before him. And it came to pass when Jehudi had read three or four columns or verses, that he cut it with a penknife and cast it into the fire that was in the brazier, until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was in the brazier. The king doesn't merely suffice with ignoring the contents of the prophecy or with cutting it up and tearing up the words of Jeremiah, but burning the words in the brazier. And the continuation of the chapter, undoubtedly also, after all, in the ninth month. Beginning in verse 27, we read, the word of God came to Jeremiah, after the king had burned the roll, and the words which Baruch wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah, saying, God's words to Jeremiah, take you again another roll. 
and write in all the former words that were in the first roll, which Yoachim, the king of Judah, has burned. And concerning Yoachim, king of Judah, you shall say, thus says God, you have burned this roll, saying, why have you written therein, saying the king of Babylon shall certainly come and destroy this land and shall cause to cease from thence man and beast? Therefore, thus says God concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he shall have none to sit upon the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out in the day to the heat and in the night to the frost. Far from a royal burial, he won't have any burial at all. And I will visit upon him and his seed and his servants their iniquity. And I will bring upon them and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem and upon the men of Judah all the evil that I have spoken to them and they hearkened not. And the continuation indeed. Jeremiah took another role, gave it to Baruch, the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire, and there were added besides unto them many like words. They just got worse. Well, I'm sure you can well appreciate that in our survey of the ninth month, we've gotten off to a most inauspicious beginning, but we're not finished yet. Granted, this first appearance of the ninth month is in the context of retribution, of destruction. Jerusalem is headed toward its first calamitous end, destruction and exile. We encounter the ninth month again in the context of its rebuilding. We consider the words of the prophet Haggai in chapter 2. In verse 10, we read explicitly, not only the month of the prophecy, but also the date. In the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius. The significance of the date Of course, only centuries later, we will come to know the 24th day of the ninth month as the eve of Hanukkah every year. And what is the significance of this very date, the eve of Hanukkah? We read on in verses 15 and on, the words of God by Haggai the prophet. Now I pray you consider from this day and forward, before a stone was laid upon a stone in the temple of God, that is before the construction project of rebuilding the holy temple had commenced, I smote you with blasting and with mildew and with hail in all the work of your hands. Yet you turned not to me, says God. There was no repentance. There was no return. Verse 18, consider, I pray you, from this day and forward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of God's temple was laid, consider it. So, consider the date that would become the eve of Hanukkah was the date upon which the foundation of God's temple was first laid at the beginning of the second temple period. And the consequence, in marked contrast with the punishment with which you were smitten, in verse 17, before you commenced upon this construction, Verse 19, is the seed yet in the barn? Yea, the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree have not brought forth, but from this day I will bless you. And we have yet another prophecy, same date, 
Verse 20, the word of God came the second time unto Haggai in the 24th day of the month. We know which month. Saying, speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations, and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them, and the horses and their riders will come down, every one, by the sword of his brother. In that day, says the God of hosts, will I take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shaltiel, says God, and will make you as a signet, for I have chosen you, says the God of hosts. A signet. First of all, in the most specific, perhaps literal sense, the signet is the means through which the king signs and seals his decrees. Zerubbabel is become the precious instrument in the hands of God for signing and sealing God's decrees. But perhaps in a more expansive sense, the significance of the signet. A brief survey. Consider, first, in the Song of Songs, in chapter 8, verse 6, set me as a seal, literally, as a signet upon your heart. As a seal, again, signet upon your arm. For love is strong as death. Zeal is as hard as the grave. The flashes thereof are flashes of fire, of a great flame, alternatively, of a a very flame of God. The signet, the precious instrument that adorns one's hand, that is kept close always, implies intimacy, implies closeness. It's significant to consider how the signet figures prominently in particular in the history of one single significant family. Recall in Genesis chapter 38, the context, Tamar, Judah's daughter-in-law, has been twice widowed and is waiting for her next husband, Judah's third son, who Judah is reluctant to wed to Tamar after the disastrous consequences of the first two weddings. And so Tamar contrives to bring offspring into the world through Judah directly. The story we all know, it's not a simple story to recount, but we read from verse 14 and on how, in essence, Tamar tricks, one could say, seduces Judah. In verse 15, when Judah saw her, he thought her to be a harlot, for she had covered her face. And he turned unto her, by the way, and said, Come, I pray me, I pray you, let me come in unto you. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What will you give me that you may come unto me? And he said, I will send you a kid of the goats from the flock. And she said, Will you give me a pledge till you send it? And he said, What pledge shall I give you? And she said, Your signet. Your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. And he gave them to her. And we know the continuation of the story. She disappears, so he never has the opportunity to recover the pledge. And we read in verse 24 and on, it came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has played the harlot. 
And moreover, behold, she is with child by harlotry. And Judah said, bring her forth and let her be burned. When she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law saying, by the man whose these are, am I with child? And she said, discern, I pray you, whose are these, the signet and the cords and the staff? And Judah acknowledged them and said, we could translate the Hebrew in more than one possible way. Either she is more righteous than I, or she is right. It is from me. One way or the other, Judah concedes. He admits, and the consequence, of course, is not only that Tamar's life is saved, but also the unborn lives that are within her womb. As we read in verse 27, twins were in her womb, and what is particularly germane for this little exercise is the name of that son who makes a breach for himself in being born after his brother's birth had already begun. And his name was called Peretz. Who is that Peretz? We know in the genealogy that we read in Ruth chapter 4, these are the generations of Peretz. Peretz begot Chetzron, and from Chetzron to Ram, Ram to Aminadav, Aminadav to Nachshon, Nachshon to Salmon, Salmon to Boaz, Boaz to Obed, Obed to Jesse, and Jesse to David. King David. Nine generations to Peretz, ten to Judah. The signet is what enables King David to be born. And of course, we recognize very well the birth of King David is not simply the birth of King David. It's the birth of the entire Davidic dynasty up to and including Messiah. What is perhaps most directly relevant for our purposes is the continuation of the genealogy that we read as summarized, summarized most exhaustively in the first book of Chronicles, in chapter 3, where we read the entire lineage of the Davidic dynasty as the kings of Judah, including the sons of Josiah, the firstborn Yohanan, the second Yehoiakim. This is none other than the Yehoiakim of whom we read earlier. And the sons of Yehoiakim, Yehoniah his son, Tzedekiah his son, we'll be considering Yehoniah in just another moment. Yehoiakim, 17 generations to King David. And again, from Yehoiakim, we have Yehoniah, and then Shaltiel, his son, and Pidaya, his son, and the sons of Pidaya, Zerubbabel, and the, and the others. Zerubbabel then is a great, great grandson of Yehoiakim, great grandson of Yehoniah. How ironic when, on the one hand, we consider the dire prophecy of doom and destruction that we read ninth month regarding Yehoiakim, regarding Yehoiakim's descendants not being fit to sit upon the throne of King David. And in the ninth month, God's prophecy through Haggai to Zerubbabel, making Zerubbabel into God's signet. It's particularly ironic when we consider in Jeremiah chapter 22, 
the prophecy that perhaps in even more dire terms than those words that were directed at Yehoiakim prophesies doom and destruction to Yehoniah, Yehoiakim's son, Zerubbabel's great-grandfather. Beginning in verse 24, as I live, says God, the Choniah, the son of Yehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet upon my right hand, yet will I pluck thee thence, and I will give you into the hand of them that seek your life, and into the hand of them of whom you are afraid, even into the hand of Nebuchad Retzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of the Chaldeans. And I will cast you out, and your mother that bore you into another country where you were not born, and there shall you die. But the land whereunto they long to return, there they shall not return. And in the continuation, indeed, Yehoniah is cast out, he and his seed, into the land which they know not. And finally, in verse 30, thus says God, write you this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. Is this a problem? Is it a contradiction? Of course, the answer is no. It is perhaps an exquisite irony, but most of all, an object lesson in the power of repentance. Yehoiakim and his son, Yehoniah, are the recipients of these words of utmost doom and destruction. That wasn't the consequence of something that was predestined for them. That was a consequence of the choices they made. And perhaps the most vivid expression, especially when one considers that the whole Davidic dynasty, in some sense, derived from that signet of Judah, is God's words regarding Yehoniah saying, even if he were a signet upon my right hand, I would pluck him out. And nonetheless, Yehoniah's great-grandson, Zerubbabel, at the time of the return, because he returned, not just because he returned from Babylon, because he returned to God, becomes the recipient of these exhilarating words of reassurance by the hand of Haggai, the promise, God is making you into his signet, right? Not your great-grandfather or your great-great-grandfather, they chose as they did. But the worst prophecies, the most horrific, dire words of God are always conditional. If it's a prophecy of destruction, it can always be averted. It's in our hands. It's up to us. Repentance is a gate that God leaves open all the time. And so, when we consider what the ninth month teaches us thus far, Again, on the one hand, the prophecy of doom and destruction in Jeremiah, chapter 36, ninth month. On the other, on the very day in which the foundation of the second temple is laid, 24th day of the ninth month, God sends by the hand of Haggai, the prophet, the promise of restoration. Because of that repentance, even though Ichoniah was depicted as the signet that is plucked off and cast away, his great-grandson is the signet upon God's hand, so to speak. That message of taking stock and returning to God is one that permeates 
the other references that we encounter in the Bible to the ninth month, of which there are in particular yet three, and they're all in the second temple period. The first that we'll note here is in the book of Ezra, in chapter 10, verse 9. Dire times are in store for the returnees to Zion. Then all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered themselves together unto Jerusalem. Within three days, it was the ninth month, on the 20th day of the month. And all the people sat in the broad place before the house of God, trembling because of this matter, because of their dereliction, because of the extent to which they had turned their backs on God's word, and because of the great rain. That is, it's not explicitly clear whether they were trembling because they were out in the cold and rain, or they were trembling because it was the ninth month and the rains had not come as they should have. But of course, the most important message here is they were trembling because of this matter, because they were concerned with reestablishing their covenant with God, with returning to God. On a similar plane, except cast in the very personal words of Nehemiah, we read at the beginning of what in our tradition is the second part of the book of Ezra, what in the more common reckoning nowadays is called the book of Nehemiah. In our tradition, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah are one. At the beginning of the book of Nehemiah, we read same timing. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Chachaliah. Now it came to pass in the month Kislev, in the 20th year as I was in Shushan, the capital. Kislev. Kislev is the name we use for the ninth month. Now, I must note, it hasn't appeared in any of the previous passages. In general, the names of the months that we employ routinely nowadays are Babylonian names. Indeed, in our tradition, the names of the months returned with the returnees from the Babylonian exile. Kislev appears in the Bible on exactly two occasions. Again, referring to the ninth month. What happens in the ninth month? In the continuation of Nehemiah's words, Hanani, one of my brethren, came out of Judah, he and men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, that were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and I fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Fasting and praying, that's returning. That's repentance. That's what has been the recurrent message of the ninth month. And finally, the last instance in which we encounter the ninth month and the second of the two instances in the Bible in which we encounter explicit reference to the name Kislev, we've noted these words in other contexts as well. In Zechariah chapter 7, the beginning of the chapter, we read, it came to pass in the fourth year of King Darius that the word of God came unto Zechariah in the fourth day of the ninth month in Kislev. And just what was the content of God's word to Zechariah telling the prophet of the impending entreaty? of the people. When Sarezer and Regemelech and his men had sent to Bethel to entreat the favor of God and specifically to ask the question, should I weep in the fifth month, separating myself as I have done these so many years? 
Now, parenthetically, we've noted this in other contexts. It seems, in a way, strange that this question is being advanced in the ninth month pertaining to the fast that takes place only in the fifth month, which, after all, is over half a year away, except we can discern, perhaps not explicitly in the question, but in the answer, that the question pertained not only to the fast of the fifth month. Because in the following chapter in Zechariah, in chapter 8, we read God's answer, verse 19, thus says the God of hosts, the fast of the fourth month, and the fast of the fifth, and the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth, shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness and cheerful seasons, but love you truth and peace. Well, perhaps the timing of the question in the ninth month was intended to get clarification regarding the fast of the tenth month as well. But in any case, the question is being posed in the ninth month. And once again, in essence, it's all about returning to God. Should I be fasting in order to return to God? And ultimately, the answer that God provides is, now it is time to rebuild the fast days because you are returning to God. Become days of joy and gladness and cheerful seasons. But the truth is that this process of returning isn't over. Because the continuation of the prophecy, verse 20, thus says the God of hosts, it shall yet come to pass that there shall come peoples and the inhabitants of many cities. And in the context, it becomes clear in verse 23, we aren't only speaking of people from the nation of Israel. And the inhabitants of one city shall go to another saying, let us go speedily to entreat the favor of God and to seek the God of hosts. I will go also. Yea, many peoples and mighty nations shall come to seek the God of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of God. It's a process, a process of return, a process of renewing that bond. And once again, it is a process that is heralded through God's words, in this instance, to Zechariah, specifically in the ninth month. And of course, one cannot help but add additionally, as we noted explicitly in the words of the prophet Haggai, that this process of return rededicating ourselves to God is inevitably connected with the rebuilding of the Holy Temple. The foundation is laid again on the 24th day of the ninth month. So when we consider in retrospect the passages that we've seen from Jeremiah chapter 36, the prophecy of retribution, of destruction, to Yehoiakim, to the words of Haggai, the encouragement of Zerubbabel and of the people who have now dedicated themselves to rebuilding and reconnecting, to what we read in the prophecy of Zechariah, as we just saw, and the record of the events of the return in Ezra and Nehemiah. There's an opportunity. We can return. We can rededicate. And it's up to us. Now, simultaneously, there's an additional dimension that certainly needs to be borne in mind. And it pertains to these verses that we have just read concerning the Renaissance, the spiritual reawakening of which God speaks in his words to Zechariah, 
here in chapter 8 from verse 20 and on. Were these words truly fulfilled in the Second Temple period? This is a painful question to consider. And their short answer is no, they were not. There was an opportunity that existed. But was that opportunity entirely fulfilled? No, it wasn't. And here's where we need to recall a foundational message. We've noted this in other contexts in the past that emerges in God's words to Isaiah in chapter 55. In particular, when we read in verses 10 and 11, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not there, except it waters the earth and makes it bring forth and bud and gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me empty-handed, except it accomplish that which I desire and make the thing whereto I sent it prosper. So when God's word comes into this world, it will be fulfilled. It will be fulfilled sooner or later. It will not return empty-handed. And so it is in that vein that when we consider the prophecies that pertain to the Second Temple, let's return to Haggai. Chapter 2, the verses that immediately precede the ones that we read earlier. In verse 6 and on, for thus says the God of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the choicest things of all nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the God of hosts. Mine is the silver and mine is the gold says the God of hosts. The glory of this latter house will be greater than that of the former, says the God of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, says the God of hosts. Was the glory of the second temple greater than that of the first? No, it was not. It also was not a place of peace. Likewise, in Zechariah chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, in your Bibles, the division of the chapters may differ. It may not be verse 14, maybe earlier, perhaps verse 10. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of you, says God. And many nations will join themselves to God in that day, and will be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of you. God says it again. I will dwell in the midst of you, and you will know that the God of hosts has sent me unto you. That indwelling of God's presence in the Hebrew, the Shekhinah, that indwelling is prophecy. The prophecy was not restored in the second temple period. The last of the prophets prophesied at the beginning of the second temple period. Indeed, it is proposed by some of our old scholars and commentators that they prophesied because they had absorbed the spirit of prophecy yet in the first temple period and were able to maintain it in the second temple period. But the second temple did not spawn prophets. The promise remained unfulfilled. Why it remained unfulfilled? In our tradition, because when God enabled us to return to the Holy Land, when Cyrus proclaimed 
who is it from among his people? God, his Lord, is with him. And let him ascend. They didn't descend. Only a minority came. And God's promises for the second temple were only partly fulfilled. We didn't return as we had been summoned to return. So what happens to the promises? They're still promises. They don't return empty-handed. They will be fulfilled. We pray spiritually in our days. They haven't been fulfilled yet. But when we ask ourselves, what then are we to conclude? What does this communicate to us with respect to the whole enterprise of the rebuilt temple to which again Haggai and Zechariah refer? There is a subtle but crucial lesson that we can glean from the Torah's narrative of creation. In Genesis chapter 2, in verses 1, 2, and 3, we read of God's Sabbath. And in particular, in verse 3, God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because that in it he ceased from all of his work that God created to do. Now, I'm translating very literally here. That's exactly what the Hebrew reads. Asher bar Elohim la'asot. Again, that God created to do. And both in the Hebrew original and in the English translation, what is, of course, striking is that last addendum. In the Hebrew, it's one word in English, too. To do, la'asot. Seems completely superfluous. In it, he ceased from all his work that God created. That God created to do? What does to do mean? But of course, upon reflection, we appreciate what it means. God created a world that isn't complete. Everything that God had created, he created to do. Keep on doing. It's not done yet. We have an ancient tradition that sees the work in Hebrew, the melacha, creative, productive labor, that God did in creation, actually attaining its completeness, where we read in the Hebrew, vatishlam kol melacha, all the work was completed. We read those words, all the work was completed in context, having nothing to do with creation of the world, having to do with the construction of the holy temple. In the first book of Kings, in chapter 7, verse 51, then all the work that King Solomon wrought in the house of God was completed. So, taking the juxtaposition of the completion of all the work on a simple, perhaps facile plane. Well, when God created the world, it was created to do. All of that work only becomes complete when the temple is built. And on some plane, yes, that is the message. Because building the holy temple, building a place on earth that provides us with conduit, the connection to be able to bond with God is singly the utmost culmination of what this world is all about. And yet simultaneously, I think we will appreciate the message here is not once the temple is finished, we can all go home. This is an ongoing challenge. It is most aptly represented in the Holy Temple. It is most vividly expressed in establishing that consecrated place to connect with God. But ultimately, that's what life itself is all about. That dynamism, that summons. You come into this world with potential 
actualize it. That's what you're here for. And indeed, in that vein, we consider, we've noted these words in other contexts as well. The words of the prophet Zechariah, the words that are communicated to the prophet as a blessing to Joshua, the high priest. In our tradition, this prophecy is intimately connected with the commemoration of Hanukkah. And indeed, in the reading in the prophets, in synagogues, on the Sabbath, the Shabbat of Hanukkah, we read this prophecy. Thus says the God of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and if you will keep my charge and will also judge my house and will also keep my courts. Now, again, I'm going to translate literally. Then I shall give you walkers among these standing ones. Word for word, that's what the Hebrew says. Your translations may differ. But, I shall give you walkers among these standing ones. What in the world does that mean? Standing ones, walkers, who is either one? But of course, upon reflection, we understand, and we've noted this elsewhere as well, the standing ones are the angels. We read in Ezekiel chapter 1, and verse 7, their legs were straight legs. Verse 9, they turned not when they went, they went everyone straight forward. Angels, don't turn, don't move, don't change. They are created as spiritual beings and so they remain. They are, if you will, pure actualization from the get-go. Man is the walking one. Man is the one who comes into the world as merely a physical being but with a latent spiritual potential. And the challenge of all of life is actualizing that potential. Building the Holy Temple is perhaps the most vivid, most powerful expression, the culmination of the actualization of that potential. But aren't we all summoned every day, all the time, to actualize? that latent potential. As we read in Job chapter 5, verse 7, man is born unto labor. And the flying beings fly upward. Flying beings, the angels, they fly upward. But as for us, we in this world, we're born to labor. We've got work to do. And it's not going to be easy. It's an ongoing process. And as for that process, as for that struggle, as we read in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, words that at first brush are downright depressing. What profit has man of all his labor, wherein he labors under the sun? And indeed, it's the same word, amal, that we find in Job chapter five, verse seven. So what does all that labor accomplish? That's the way we might understand the words of Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse three. Under the sun, indeed, what profit has man? Because as we read a little bit later on in the chapter, in Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse nine, there is nothing new under the sun. But in our tradition, we append to this realization, the additional realization. There's nothing new under the sun. But you can get beyond the sun. What prophet has man of all his labor, wherein he labors under the sun? Well, again, in our tradition, we append to that bleak observation under the sun. There is no prophet. 
beyond the sun. There is profit. The sun, of course, is that heavenly luminary that bestows upon us its light and heat, keeps everything running. All of life on earth depends upon the sun. In the physical universe, for us, the sun reigns supreme. But there's something more than merely the physical universe. There is a more sublime level of illumination than the natural illumination that comes from the sun. And so we read in Exodus chapter 27, in verse 20, you shall command the people of Israel that they bring unto you pure olive oil beaten for the light to cause a lamp to burn continually in the tent of meeting without the veil which is before the testimony Aaron and his sons shall set it in order to burn from evening to morning before God always a constant reminder there is a more sublime light than merely the light of the sun in the construction project of the holy temple we read a somewhat cryptic description of one of the details of the construction in the first book of kings chapter 6 verse 4 and for the house he made windows in the hebrew shikufim atumim the hebrew too is a rather cryptic turn of phrase in our tradition that means the windows of the holy temple were wide outside and narrow inside. The opposite of what you would expect if the purpose of the windows were to admit sunlight, admit the ambient light from outside into the temple within. But that's not the purpose of the windows. The holy temple, so to speak, doesn't need the sunlight coming from outside. On the contrary, the purpose of the windows was for the holy temple to broadcast its light, its light to the outside. That light ultimately is not merely a physical one. There is, of course, the physical representation of that light, and it's the lamp that you need to cause to burn continually, the candelabrum, the menorah. But the light of the menorah, that physical light, that light that you kindle, signifies something more than merely physical light. As we read in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23, the commandment, the mitzvah, is a lamp. And the teaching, the Torah, the instruction, is light. That when we kindle the menorah, when we kindle the candelabrum, the light that envelops the earth is not merely physical light. It is indeed the light that goes beyond the sun. The spiritual light. The spiritual light suffused into the physical world that ultimately elevates it beyond a merely physical plane. And it is in that vein that we read in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them the light shined. In our tradition, the people who are walking in darkness who have seen a great light are the people who are toiling to understand God's word, studying his Torah, toiling, struggling. Again, man is born unto labor, as we saw in the words of Job. But when we toil to connect with God's word, when we learn the message of the ninth month, which is all about returning to God 
and rededicating ourselves to God, then we see the great light, that great spiritual light, the light of the Torah. And this light, of course, is by no means intransitive. It's not just for our own personal illumination and enlightenment. As we read in Isaiah chapter 42, verses 6 and 7, I, God, have called you in righteousness, and have taken hold of your hand and kept you, and set you for a covenant of the people, for a light of the nations, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Now, of course, we understand those who are sitting in darkness, also in a literal sense. So many people, such darkness. We hear and read of the calamitous events swirling around us right now. Consider the butchery taking place just on our northern border in Syria in the city of Khalim, Aleppo, and how many other places where indeed the prisoners in the dungeons are sitting in darkness. There's that level as well, but not only that level. Because when we are summoned to be a light of the nations, it is to communicate that spiritual light to a world that is so hungering and thirsting for it. It doesn't even know what it's missing. Likewise, in Isaiah chapter 49, from verse 3 and on, he said unto me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. And the prophet says, But I said I have labored in vain. I have spent my power for naught and vanity. Yet surely my judgment is with God and my recompense with my God. And now says God that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and that Israel be gathered unto him. That message of repentance and restoration. God says, verse 6, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to establish the tribes of Jacob and to restore the offspring of Israel. I will also give you for a light of the nations that my salvation may be to the end of the earth. And of course, we've noted this many times. God lays out the agenda here. It's not just to save you. That light isn't just for you. It's to be light of the nations. Indeed, that God's salvation will be to the end of the earth. In verse 8, in an acceptable time, a time of favor, have I answered you? And in a day of salvation, I have helped you, and I will keep you, and give you for covenant of the people to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritages. You broadcast that light. It's a light of return, return not only for you. It's a light of dedication, but not only your dedication. Dedicating that beacon of light that ultimately will illuminate and enlighten the entire world. So that we can read in Isaiah chapter 60, in verses 1 through 3. Arise, shine, for your light is come, and the glory of God is shown upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, gross darkness the peoples, but upon you. God will shine and his glory will be seen upon you and nations will walk at your light and kings at the brightness of your shining. You can illuminate the world. That's your summons. Now, considering in this light, in retrospect, our survey of the ninth month, there is, of course, inevitably, an additional dimension, maybe really the most basic that we bear in mind. When is the ninth month? The ninth month is at the time of the solstice. 
the ninth month is when for those of us who are in the northern hemisphere the darkness is greatest there is the least light a time when more than any other time of year we look around and we see a dark world but the summons of the ninth month is you can do this and god is summoning you to do it you can repent you can return you can rededicate you can kindle the lamp you can bring the light to a world so dark it doesn't even know what it's missing this is the message of the ninth month i feel compelled to share with you one final thought it's not in any biblical passage but it's an ancient tradition that we have that when adam and eve in their first year of existence saw the days getting shorter and shorter they figured this is it the world is going dark this is the punishment for our sin it's all over and so they fasted and prayed until after the solstice they saw the days were starting to get longer again and they realized oh this is the way of nature and in subsequent years those days that had been observed as days of fasting and prayer were days of celebration days of celebration in which they gave thanks to god those days started out as festivals dedicated to god but at some point as humanity degenerated those festivals became pagan idolatrous festivals when it is most dark people start groping for light no telling where they'll find it it could be in a good place it could be in a terrible place and it is at that very time of greatest darkness that we strive to dedicate ourselves to the true light the light of torah the light of god's word the light of god to illuminate our way in the darkness the ninth month is all about learning these lessons the ninth month then is the time in which we celebrate Chanukah, dedication dedication of the holy temple that is a beacon of light for the entire world and dedication of course ultimately of ourselves to bringing that light of god to such a dark world that we have out there it's all up to us the most important lesson of this survey of the ninth month is god gives us this charge and as we've noted many times in the past this really is the greatest gift imaginable because of course god should, could shine all the light on his own god doesn't need us to serve as his beacons ultimately it is after all the glory of god that is shown upon you but god still summons us you arise shine your light has come it's in your hands i'm begging you be my junior partners illuminate that dark world out there you have the wherewithal to do it it's a time for dedication and rededication and rededication once again a time 
to bring the light to a world that's begging for it. When we consider the lessons of the ninth month, we appreciate why the message of dedication is so very germane now and always. God bless you.